Good morning, church. You stand. Worship with us. If you're joining us online, we're so glad you're here today. Let's worship our God. Sing to Him. Just one word. You calm the storm that surrounds me. Just one word. The darkness has to retreat. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way. Nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you heal what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. Just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes are open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power. Good morning. It's so glad to be with you guys, especially if you're gathered with us. If you're at home, we love you. We're so, we're missing you. We can't wait to see you soon when we can all be together. Hopefully that day will come sooner than later. 
we worship to the glory of God, right? We praise the one who made it right with us before God, who is our ever-present help, our comfort, our time of need. In worship, I think of 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which says, whatever you do, do to the glory of God. And that's essentially what worship is. It goes beyond just singing, but to all of life. So let's bring some glory to our Lord. Let's sing to him. Let's proclaim that he is good, our God, our Savior. Would you sing this with me? Should nothing of our effort stand, no legacy survive, unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders try to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me, what is your life? that vanishes a dawn all glory be to Christ to him all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ his rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to Christ his will done his kingdom come on earth as is above who is himself our daily bread praise him the lord of love let living water satisfy the thirsty without price we'll take a cup of kindness yet all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ his rule and reign will ever sing all glory be to
throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Father, we come and applaud you, our perfect Father. Thanks for Father's Day where we can celebrate you and all you've given to us, accomplished for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. And most days I feel like I've fallen short and failed, like you're disappointed in me. And so thank you so much for your reminder that Jesus, when he said it's finished, he meant it, that he had accomplished everything that you now give like a good father would. You give salvation by grace through faith in him. And so I pray for us today as we look at this church at Antioch, how awesome they were. I pray you'd open our eyes to the fact that they were awesome, not because they were super active, but because they simply were abiding in Jesus. And so today, would you set us free, those who think Christianity is a burden, those who think Christianity is about us trying to do more and more to earn your approval, Father, I pray you would use your, your holy word to strengthen, to bring hope and joy that this life of faith might be about delight, not duty. 
And so I've got nothing to offer your people. So as I empty myself, I pray you'd fill me up with your spirit to serve your children through your word, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome uh, first timers that, that have come. We're so glad you're here. My name is Dave. Uh, I'm, I'm a recovering addict, alcoholic, saved by grace. There's nothing special about me uh, except that Jesus loved me, pursued me, redeemed me. Um, and most days I wake up and I'm still surprised I'm a pastor. And so thank you for coming and being part of today when we just open up the word together. At Hillside, uh, I thought you were leaving and you're back. It's so good to see you. Uh, at Hillside, we're simple people. We believe Jesus changes everything. Uh, and that's not just a tagline. He actually does. He, he begins by changing us personally. And, and he comes to dwell inside of us. And as he grows us and changes us, he uses us to change all that's around us. So we want an avalanche, we get a glacier, we're often frustrated about that, but Jesus really is at work. Now we've been looking at how he does that. He does that uh, through what this world would call foolishness. He puts us together in these groups called the body of Christ, the church, uh, where every, every week we get together, we celebrate, and then we go out to be everyday missionaries in everyday places. And the world would look at us and say, man, that's foolish. Do you guys actually think anything's changing? And I have to say, well, yeah, he used the church to change me. And so I know he's doing that over and over. We've been looking at this in the book of Acts. So if you'll open up to Acts chapter 11, I'm going to read verse 18 or 19 down for, through verse 30. Before I do, I typically don't apologize before a sermon. I, I'll typically apologize after. Let me preemptively apologize because I, I'm going to be trying to explain things that are inexplicable. I'm going to be using finite, earthly words to describe an infinite, eternal truth. And so I'm, I'm, as I go through to define the undefinable, there's an amount of foolishness today, and, and I don't know exactly how I'm going to be able to explain it. So let me apologize beforehand, and then I'm going to walk through, and my first point, I will tell you the sermon that I'm not going to preach, so that'll be the first 15 minutes. And then I'll tell you the sermon I'm going to preach and trying to try to define the undefinable. So let me read it to you. Luke chapter 11, verse 19 through verse 30, Luke writes, God says this. And notice how many times the church at Antioch comes up. You're going to hear Antioch, 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 Antioch. Because the epicenter of the church now has moved. It's moving from Jerusalem to Antioch. And so we're going to look at why Antioch was an awesome church. And hopefully there will be some takeaways how we can be an awesome church. Watch. Verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews alone. But there were some of, of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Well, the news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Spirit and, and of faith, and a considerable number were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. And when he had found him, he, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the church and taught considerable numbers. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, at this time, uh, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the region of uh, in the reign of Claudius. And, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And, they, and this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. So now, uh, let me walk you through this. I'm going to give you a big theological picture, a little theological picture, and then we'll begin to look at this church at Antioch together. Um, 
If you read straight through the Bible, one of the, one of the, the truths that you would walk away with is just the doctrine of immutabil- immutability. That just means God's unchanging. That, that he's the same yesterday, today, forever. Uh, that you're never going to run into God and, and him change his mind or be like, oh man, I decided not to send you there. I'm sorry, come back. He, he's unchanging. And this is good news because what this means is he gets to change everything else and make it look like him because he's perfect. So God, unchanging, he gets to change everything else. Now, if you read through the Bible, and this is going to describe all the chaos in America right now. If you read through the Bible, one of the original lies uh, at the beginning of the book is, you don't need God. You can, you can do your own thing. You can write your own story. And so we go off script, and we're searching for life apart from the source of life. Uh, horrible problems. Because when that happens, I begin saying, I'm immutable, I'm unchangeable, and I need everybody else to change. You ever seen anybody say that? What I really need is just for my spouse to change. It'll start there. Or if my parents would just change. I'm not changing. Those cats need to change. Or if the Democrats would change, or the Republicans are changed, or the Congress, or the Senate. Or... We want everyone else to change. Because we want to be immutable, unchangeable. We'll even change God, yo. It's hilarious. I'll go to AA meeting. Well, here's what I think God's like. Well, nobody cares what you think. You're a drunk. (laughs) Right? But, oh, it's offensive to say that. Not really. It's not. I don't care what I think. Like, Listen, I've lost my mind clinically before. And when you've lost your mind, you're, you're not that impressed with what you think. You're not the center of the universe, but we will even try and change God. Well, here's what I think God is like. What's a God made in your own image? That's an unhelpful God. So we want to be immutable. In the, in the gospel, this book tells the story of the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came, lived a life without sin, set us free so that now we can change. He removed my sin, sent his spirit to live inside of me, and now I can mature, I can change, and begin looking more like God. As the world is all stuck trying to change everybody else, the beauty is he changes us, puts us together so that we can be a light shining in the darkness. Here's what I'm going to show you. In a world that refuses to change, we're going to be a people who are being changed through the indwelling spirit. Here's what I need you to know. I'm going to walk through and we're going to look at the church of Antioch. And the church of Antioch was awesome. It just was. They had evangelism. They had outreach. They were generous. They were serving. They were a praying church. They were a fasting church. They were a church planting church. They were a teaching church and a preaching church. They were a caring church. They, they had authentic community. They had all of these things, and we look at it, and the danger is that when we come to a church like that, we'll look at it and we'll want to copy it. There are a lot of byproducts in Christianity. If you make the byproducts of Christianity the bullseye, you will miss everything. You will end up with moralism. Most Christians I know that grew up 70s, 80s, and 90s, we've tried to be good Christians. We've tried to do more and more and more. But I'm going to show you, doing more and more and more, living in the West, we praise production, don't we? Man, we love it when people do more. And we think God loves it when we do more. Let me show you the sermon I'm not going to preach. Start out here. We'll start out verse 19, 20, and 21 if you can pull it up. Uh, In your notes, Roman numeral one would be byproducts. I would just write down byproducts. Does everybody know what a byproduct is? A byproduct is something that is inevitably and necessarily made in the pursuit of the production of something greater. And so whenever you make something, there's going to be leftover. There's going to be byproducts. We run a great danger of making byproducts the bullseye in Christianity. So I'm going to show you the sermon I'm not going to preach. Watch. We'll start out here. Watch verse 19, 20, and 21. And I'm going to get stressed out even as I preach the sermon I'm not going to preach. Watch what the church at Antioch had. Beautiful byproducts. So... uh, 
Then verse 19, those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen, who had died earlier, made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there, verse 20, there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also and preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number believed and turned to the Lord. This church at Antioch was an evangelizing church. They were bold. They were courageous. They were about outreach. Now, here's the sermon I could preach. We should be about evangelism. We should be about outreach. If I was really wanting to lay it on, I would say, you should do more evangelism. Amen? Whoa, no amens. Do you, got, you don't like evangelism? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. And if I laid it on really thick, you should evangelize with your neighbors. Nobody can argue that. Jesus did say, go. You've got good news. Share it. And so I could say, we need to be more about evangelism. I could yell it, and I could start programs, and we could have classes on evangelism. And some of you would even do it. That's right. I need to do it more. I should do it more. Do you know it doesn't matter how much you evangelize? I could say you should evangelize more, and every single one of us would say yes. doesn't matter how much. Well, the church evangelized. But that's a sermon I'm not going to preach because it's too convicting. I just wouldn't do that to you. But it gets worse. Watch. Verse 25 and 26. Watch how awesome this church at Antioch is. Well, Barnabas left for, for Tarsus to look for Saul, Paul, and, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year, they met with the crowds, the church, and they taught considerable numbers. And, and the disciples, they were about discipleship. They were, they were first called Christians in Antioch. One of the byproducts of Christianity, they were a discipling church. And I could say, we need to disciple more. You should be discipled and be discipling someone else. We would all say, yeah, that's true. I've read about that in the Bible. I think we should do. They were a teaching church. I could say we should teach more. So we're going to start a Sunday night service and a Wednesday night service. Amen? Somebody laughs. That's, this is so encouraging for me. And you should be there because in Antioch, they were a teaching, preaching, discipling church, and we should teach, preach, and disciple. <sighs> All of a sudden, it sounded like Christianity is pretty busy. I need to be evangelizing and outreaching and preaching and teaching and discipling. Well, wait, it gets worse. Watch this. Verse 27 through 30. Now, there was at that time, uh, through the pro that prophet came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus stood up, and he began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world, and this took place... Uh, in the reign of Claudius, and in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of Barnabas and Saul and the elders. Not only was the church at Antioch an evangelizing, outreaching, preaching, teaching, discipling church, they were a serving church. They gave, they were generous as much as they could. <laughs> So I could say, Hillside, if we're going to be an awesome church, we've got to copy the church at Antioch, and you've got to give. You've got to be generous. Where are you serving? Where are you pouring out? And now we've got this list. Okay, to be a good Christian, I've got to evangelize. I've got to practice outreach, discipleship, teaching. If I'm really going to be a good preacher, I've got to be a preacher, a missionary. I've got to be uh, gracious and giving and serving. All of a sudden, there's a whole bunch of stuff to do, isn't there? See, this is, this is what I learned from skydiving. I woke up once and I wanted to go skydiving. I thought it sounded like fun. I had watched Mission Impossible. I wanted to dive through the air, reach terminal velocity, have fun. Anybody ever woken up and just decided, I'm going skydiving? Amen. One. That's good. <laughs> Two. So I went, ends up, you can't do it unless you're licensed. You've got to go tandem. I was like, well, that's okay. I can do that. Well, I got paired with this big old gal 
that I was going to be strapped to. Um, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm not sexist. That's, I'm going to jump out of a plane. Well, she had some high anxiety issues, high worry issues. So she just started putting all of this stuff. Hey, when I strap you into your baby adult ergo and I've got you strapped to me, and it was, man, I was walking around. You ever seen that Saturday Night Live? It was horrible. I was going to show you a clip, but it's so emasculating I couldn't, not on Father's Day. Yeah, no, Travis, it wouldn't. So she started saying, hey, you need to know this. Like, you could die and I could die. And I was like, well, I know. That's why I signed the paper. Totally get it. I just want to to Tom Cruise this thing, Mission Impossible, Terminal Velocity. She's like, yeah, we're not going to do that because you'll die. And I need you to keep your head up all the time or else you'll die. And I need you to keep your arms back at all times or else you're going to slap me in the head. I'll die, then you'll die. And I need your feet back. Is your head up and your arms are back? Or else you'll knock me out, I'll die, and you'll die because I won't fly, I I won't, the parachute, you're going to die. And so there was just all of this stuff. She gave me a list of like 72 things that I had to remember or else she was going to die and I was going to die. Everybody's going to die and it's going to splat. So I I get up in the airplane. I've got the video of it. I get it. We, she carries me out like a baby year ago. And I'm at the edge of the plane. I'm, I'm looking down, and she grabs my head and pulls it up. Because again, I'm going to knock her out. She's dead. I'm dead. We're all dead. We splat. And so all of a sudden, this enjoyable, delightful dream of jumping out of a plane, going terminal velocity, spinning this way, spinning that way. It wasn't. It was a duty from the moment I got strapped into the baby ergo I was just there to bear the burden of all of these duties that I had to do to make sure she didn't die and I didn't die and we didn't go splat. I'm about to tell you something because I got done and I don't remember skydiving at all. It wasn't an enjoyable ride. It was meant to be and I paid a lot of money to enjoy it. And it wasn't like Mission Impossible at all. It was, it was more like a Saturday Night Life skit that was not enjoyable. But then I realized... You know what, in Christianity, many of us Christians that I know, when we hear Jesus say, take my yoke upon you because my my burden, it's easy. My yoke is light. Most Christians I know laugh. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's really easy as I focus and grind out evangelism and outreach and discipleship and teaching and preaching and praying and reading and going and doing and studying and Sunday morning and Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I've got to reach my neighbors. I've got to reach my coworkers. Then I've got to reach my wife. I've got to reach my husband. I've got to reach my kids. Yeah, your burden's easy, Jesus. Right. When you come to an awesome church and you say, I want to be like that, If you focus on the byproducts, you will miss the bullseye, and Christianity will be a duty, not a delight. It was intended to be a delight, y'all. When Jesus said it was finished, he meant it, yo. He meant he had done it all. So you can now come to him and confess your sin. He takes all of your sin, all of your shame, all of your guilt, and he gives you his righteousness. And now you no longer work for him. Oh, I hope I can please my father. I hope I'm evangelizing right. I hope I'm outreaching enough. I hope I'm giving and serving and sharing and loving and caring. And I hope I'm reading the right Bible. And I hope I'm memorizing right. And I hope I'm doing all these things right so he'll be pleased. He says, I'm already delighted in you because all I see when I see you is Christ Jesus because you're in him and he's in you. Has Christianity become a duty for you? If so, my guess is you're focused on the byproducts and you're missing the bullseye. Now, I've got nine minutes to preach the sermon that I actually want to preach. So that that was actually the sermon I wasn't going to preach because we all would have left saying, I need to do more and feeling very guilty. And that's what church is for most of us. Let me show you the bullseye. It's here in the text, but like everything else with Barnabas, you'll just pass over it because it's like a gentle breeze. Watch 22, 23, 24. I'll read it to you, and here's the bullseye. Verse 22, the news about them, Antioch, reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. 
and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. This, tr- this verse 22 grinds me up a little bit. It seems like any time any Gentiles were getting saved, some tattletale ran back to Jerusalem. Do you, you pick that up? I don't think that's the case, because Jerusalem sent Barnabas. They did well. I've just got my own personal issues with tattletales, and this feels like a tattletale. doesn't mean it is. I'm just sharing where I'm at. Now, that's not the bullseye. Watch. 23. Oh, you're going to miss it. I'm going to read it very softly. I don't want you to miss it. Then when he, Barnabas, arrived, he witnessed or saw the grace of God. He rejoiced, and he began to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. Did you see the bullseye? I'm, I'm going to walk you through it. What I've got to show you, so your question to me is going to be like, okay, Dave, so Christianity is not about giving, serving, praying. It's not about evangelism, outreach. It's not about me. Okay, then, then how do we do this? What are we to do and how do we do it? Those are the two questions. Watch, I'm going to show you the what we are to do. So this, a lot of people get saved. Barnabas shows up. Go ahead and pull up 22, 23. I want to show you. I don't want you to miss it. Well, you've got your Bible. And they sent Barnabas off to him. 23. I, I knuckleball over the corner. Yeah. Oh, this is good. You're not going to believe this. It's true. Let me read it. You're about to see something that's going to blow your mind. It's going to change everything. Then when Barnabas arrived and he witnessed or saw the grace of God, that God had saved wretches like me, wretches like you if you're a Gentile, outcasts, outsiders, he rejoiced, here it comes, and began to, you see the next word? Encourage. Such a simple word, isn't it? How many of you in your Bibles, you have the word encourage there? Anybody have anything else? What? Purged? I am, I've got tinnitus so bad, I can't even hear me. Oh, urged. I thought you were saying purge. I was like, I've never read that one. Which, which volume? Which, uh, urged, beseeched, entreated. Those are good King James words right there. Urged, what else? Encouraged? urged, exhorted. That's a good, is that RSV? ESV. That's good to reform the Bible. Love it. What else? Well, we got enough. See, whenever I reach a word where it can be translated four or five, six different ways, and this one can, you'll find it helped, urged, encouraged, exhorted, comforted, helped, advocated, beseeched, entreated. Whenever I reach a word where it can be translated seven, eight different ways, I have to stop. I'm like, wait a minute. Is there something wrong with the Bible or is there something wrong with me? Because how, do, how are you mixing and matching and juggling all these words? Let me tell you what it is encouraged in the NESB. Well, let me tell you why it's important so you can write that down. And let me tell you why it's impossible. Can I do those three things very quickly? What it is, encouraged, entreat, urged, exhort, beseech, it's the Greek word parakaleo. Now, you say, well, that doesn't mean anything to me. I don't study Greek and I don't, I don't. Well, let me walk you through it. Here's what it is. Para, it's a compound word, para and kaleo. And I'm going to bring this home. It's coming down the funnel to a, to a sharp point. So it's not just me talking to talk because I'm bored. Parakaleo. We have the, the English word para. We get paramedic. They come alongside. It's a very tender word. They come alongside to, to give help, comfort, and aid. Paramedic. Paralegal. I think I met one earlier. They come alongside to help out with legal cases. Parachute comes alongside so that you crash and don't splat and everybody dies. It's a very tender word. It's a very soft word. That's para. Then you have kaleo. It's a very strong word. It means to call out. It means to beseech. 
It means to point to a certain goal. Even Barnabas does it here. He beseeched, he urged, he encouraged them to stay true to the Lord with all their heart. Um, We don't even have English words that are like this. It is tough and it's tender. It's strong and it's soft. It, it, It brings together two ideas that can't coexist together. How many of you have ever been honked at? Uh, like you're in a car. Well, how many of you ever honked at someone? Let's, let's just make it real. Okay, when you are honked at, get, put yourself back in that spot, that place. Was your initial response, so you're at the light, Ronnie, you're doing your email thing, you're missing the green, right? Let's just own it. And the person by... <laughs> I put that on you, Ronnie. I don't, that, it happens to me. All of a sudden, I'll get a text and I'll be reading it, and the light will go green. The person behind me, Mop! and they're just, they let me have it. How many of you, when you've been honked at, your immediate response was, oh, they encouraged me. That's so encouraging. And you got out and you're like, thank you. I was doing, I was texting, and I didn't even see the green light. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone. Because that doesn't have, when you're honked at, you're immediately angry, aren't you? Who are you? Wah! I'll put it in reverse. My car's beer. <laughs> Take that, honker. You've been honked. See, there is no tender honking, right? The horn doesn't, like, they don't have that. Like, Excuse me, please move. (laughs) The horn was intended, and that's kaleo. What Barnabas does here is profound, and it is amazing. It is a tender hold while honking. We need to go that way. Isn't that a... We don't even... we We don't have anything that teaches us this. It is a tough and tender, strong and soft, fierce, firm and friendly word. And he marries it together. Now, let me tell you why this is important. I, told, I just told you what it is. It's a compound word that really shouldn't be together. We, we render it beseech, urge, encourage. We really don't have an English word for this. Here's why it's important. You and I in this life, I need both someone to be tender and someone to be tough with me if I'm going to grow. I need someone to be strong and soft if I'm going to grow. I need someone to para, come alongside of me and hold me. Listen, in my addiction and in my alcoholism, I need both tough and tender if I'm going to get well. If you just come alongside me and give me the truth and honk at me, Guess what? It will crush me. Like, and Christians had done that to me. Come alongside uh, Johnny Jackhammer for Jesus. You should never drink. The Bible says don't be filled with wine. Well, I know that. Why are you yelling at me? And why are you quoting verses? I know. Johnny the Jackhammer for Jesus will just give truth. <laughs> Whereas... Uh, coddling Carl will come along and just be like, it's okay, Dave, right? You're okay in your alcoholism. I'm okay. We're okay. You just keep trying hard. It'll work out. Well, if you coddle me, it will kill me. And if you just give me the truth, it'll crush me and kill me. You understand every relationship has a pH balance that needs paracleto, paracletic ministry, grace, and truth. Love and truth. Every, every relationship has a paracletic balance, pH balance. It's either too acidic, too much truth, or too alkaline, too base, not too much grace. How many of you have ever heard of Carl Walenda? Flying Walendas, High Wire Act? Yeah, I mean, they were huge. We don't do much circus stuff anymore. Carl Walenda, he was still doing High Wire Acts, when he was 78, he went down to South America. It was a 10-story high wire act at 78. Tragic. Uh, the cord shook, the wind was blowing, and he fell off. Do you know which side of the rope he fell off? 
No, because it doesn't matter. When you're 10 stories up, it doesn't matter if it's right or left. You fall, you die. And he did at 78. Uh, See, the enemy doesn't care if you're too focused on truth or too focused on grace. Either side taken too far, it'll crush you. He doesn't, he doesn't care. When Barnabas came, what he did was paracletic ministry. He spoke the truth, and he did it in love. This is almost impossible. Do you guys realize? This is almost impossible. I've never seen it done well. I don't have any models. Do you understand there's nothing in our culture that teaches us how to do this? We've been taught how to do things online. Almost everything is through email, through texts. You understand, parakaletic ministry, parakaleo, has to be face-to-face. And this is why it doesn't happen much anymore. You see, it has to happen face-to-face. Do you understand how complex communication is, what, what's going on right now? 7% of, of communication right now is just through the words that I'm saying. So I'm, I'm putting together words hopefully in sentences, and you're hearing words and sentences. That's only 7% of communication. Do you know 38% is vocal? How am I saying what I'm saying? You ever heard your wife say to you, it's not what you said, it's... Ah! (laughs) Who cares how I said it? It's what I said, and this is what I said, girl. 38% of communication is how I say what I say. Eye twitches mean something, yo. Ends up, don't they, gals? See, gals, they're like X-Men. They've got, typical humans have five senses. Gals have like seven. (laughs) This is a true statement. They can see, and it's like, you said all the right words, but it didn't come from your heart. It's how you said it. That's 38% of communication. Do you know 55% of communication is visual When he said what he said, how he said, what did he look like? Was he believable? What were his body language? 90, upwards of 93%, UCLA study, 93% of communication is visual. 7% is just the words. You see, this is why paracletic ministry, being tough and tender, strong and soft, fierce, firm, and friendly, has to happen face to face. It can't. This I've got written down here. Uh, uh, shigataki. It's not a mushroom. It's a dude who, in 1999, was like, "I've got, I've got to make emails more friendly." And so he came up with the emoticon, emoji thinking if I just put a smiley face in my email, guess what? They'll be happy, we'll be happy, we'll do away with all this miscommunication. Paracletic ministry, tough, tender words have to happen face-to-face. I don't care how many emojis you put in your email. When I'm talking to Travis, and if I have something difficult to talk about, we have to be face-to-face. I've got, he, I've got to see, are there bags under his eyes? How do I love him? How is he doing? What is his body language? Is he open to this? How do we walk through this tough, tender conversation so that he knows he's loved even as truth comes? That's what Barnabas did. That's paracletic ministry. You can truth well online, amen? Here are the facts. Look at the graph. You're an idiot. <laughs> That may all be true, bro. You understand? That's great. You gave all of the facts, all of the charts, all of the graphs, and you're like, and I'm right. Here's my expert on YouTube. You know how many experts I've watched? It's hilarious to me that I live in a society that's like, we love science. And all of a sudden, I've got two experts saying the exact opposite thing from the same graph. And everybody's like... Man, I gave you truth. You may have, friend. You may have gotten on Facebook and dumped that grenade of truth. But it's not paracletic ministry unless you're face-to-face and you can shed a tear with them and say, I love you, and I'm with you, and I'm for you. And it is not easy for me to say this, but you're not doing well. 
and I want to walk with you through this. That's what Barnabas did, and it's nearly impossible today. So now that I've brought you to the edge of despair on what encouragement paracletic ministry is, on why it's important because you need it for growth, and why it's almost impossible because none of us have seen it done really well, and we need to be face-to-face, and we almost can't ever do this because we're all broken. Then the question becomes, how did Barnabas do this? You showed us what he did. He showed up and he parakaleo encouraged them. But Dave, how did he do it? If we want to be awesome like the church at Antioch, we can't chase the byproducts. You've got to be on the bullseye. What's the bullseye? If you don't hit the bullseye, you're going to miss Christianity. And I can guarantee you, you'll be stressed out, freaked out, burnt out, and you will end up tapping out. You know how many Christians I know that finally like tapped out? It's like, I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying. Stop trying. Jesus did it all. Let's focus back on the bullseye. I'll show you how Barnabas did it. It's right here in verse 24. I'm going to show you verse 24. How did he do paracletic ministry? Tough, tender, strong, soft, fierce, firm, friendly ministry. He was a good man. What does that mean, Dave? He was full of the Holy Spirit. If you try and do Christianity on your own, you're going to be like a, an adult strapped to an instructor. You're going to be worn out and frustrated. This is why Acts is here, and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You know all of us are filled with something. Do you know that? At the fall, we were disconnected from our Creator, we have a huge void. Have you ever taken physics class? Horror vacui. Nature abhors a vacuum. It has to fill the vacuum. When you were separated from the source of life, there was a vacuum inside of you. Do you know you're filling that vacuum with something? Every single one of you. I know a lot of your stories. We will fill it. What are some of the things we fill the vacuum with? Just to toss it out. What? Yeah, plastic stuff. It smells good. Just, have you smelled a new car? Dude, I, there's something addictive about it. Just new, new stuff, new things. What else? Money, dude. More money? More money? Hyperbole? Approval. Masks are killing me. It's hard. Approval, yeah. If they're happy with me, they're happy with me. My wife's happy with me. You're happy with me. Maybe God's happy with me. But then I'm just a codependent addict. You know, the Bible says we're all addicts because we all fill that void with something. I mean, there's no end to the list of what we're filling the void with today. So Barnabas shows up. He's full of the Holy Spirit. You're full of something today. Some of us are full of ourselves. You know how I can tell? Just talk, talk to people. Like the one upper, he'll always talk about himself. Well, I was playing flag football, and I got 17 touchdowns. Dude, you were playing with kindergartners. That's not awesome. (laughs) But the person filled with self has to talk about self, because that's what they're full of. If you're full of politics, guess what you're going to talk about? I will sit down at lunch and listen to politics for hours. Mm, mm. They're idiots, and they're idiots, and this is dumb, and they're dumb, and they're dumb, and they're dumb. Hmm. You know what that person is full of? Politics, false hope. Now, if we just get everything right, then the kingdom will come. Eh, When Jesus is coming, eh, by the time he comes back, what's that? In his own time. time. Yeah, I I don't get to direct that. You're full of something, and what you're full of comes out. If you're full of anger, guess what's going to come out on your spouse? If you're full of insecurity, if you're full of anxiety, my skydiver instructor was full of worry. I'm going to die. You're going to die. We're all going to die. I wasn't mad at her. I was like, man, it sounds like you're full of worry. You should probably take a chill pill. I'm like, relax. We're all full of something. When you become a Christian, the command from Scripture is a present act of continuous, repeated thing. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit. David, how, how do I get filled with the Holy Spirit? Is that a prayer? Is that a sermon? Is that a seminar? Do I need to read? Do I need to fast? What, why are we so addicted to doing? 
God loves to fill empty spaces, y'all. It's in nature and it's in us. He loves to fill empty spaces. So how do you be filled with the Holy Spirit? Humble yourself, empty yourself, repent, have a contrite heart. God draws near to the humble and contrite and he will fill you up. And when he does, you you can begin walking that life of grace and truth. Para kaleo, walking in the truth and love together. This is, this is exactly what Barnabas did. And when he did, you see, he'll say, I'm so afraid for you. Let me just put out my pastor's heart. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse, verse three. I'm afraid for you that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so you too will be led astray from the purity and simplicity of devotion to Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about you and how much you can do. It's not about you and how awesome you are. It's not about you and how great you are at evangelism and outreach and generosity and serving and teaching and discipling and doing all those things. Christianity is supernatural. It is about Jesus Christ. And when you humbly empty yourself, the Spirit of God will take residence in your heart when you surrender to King Jesus. And do you know what will begin growing inside of you? Paul talks about it in Galatians chapter 5, 22, 23, 24. Certain byproducts will be produced in the pursuit of Jesus Christ and knowing him. Things like love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness. Certain things will become delightful for you. I don't like being in front of crowds and I don't like teaching. I don't like preaching. I asked Jesus two things when I gave my life to him. Please don't make me work at fast food and please don't make me a pastor. Do you know he moved me to Texas? you know what my first job was? Dairy Queen, Hunger Busters, Belt Busters, and Dude Burgers, bro. And then he made, made me a pastor. Do you know what? There's nothing I would rather do than care for a group of people and point them to Jesus Christ because it's no longer a duty. It's a delight to love. This is what Jesus produces in you, and these things begin to flow out of you. I don't evangelize anymore because it's what Jesus asked me to do. He puts people around me. I was, I was picking up tea gins. I get basil shrimp fried rice, and I had a shirt on. It said something about Jesus. All of a sudden, somebody was like, man, what, what's your shirt all about? I looked down, and I was like, Oh, my name's Dave. I'm a recovering addict and alcoholic. Jesus changed my life. She's like, really? Can we talk about it? Jesus sets it up, and I get to do it out of delight. It's no longer duty. Here's the bottom line. I'm going to wrap up with this. When you understand the truth of the good news of Christianity, when you see Jesus clearly, and when you understand what he does, your life will change. Let me tell you this. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. We're talking about paracletic ministry, paracleto. Come alongside and spur along to love and good deeds. Do you know John takes this, this verb of coming alongside and spurring on, and he turns it into a noun in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. He uses the same word, paracleton. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. Here's what you need to know about your Savior. John writes and says, my little children, I write these things to you that you may not sin. Plan A, always, don't sin. It's a good idea. And if anyone sins, we have a, yeah, we translate it there, advocate. It's the same word used here. It's a helper, a comforter. Uh, it's, it's one who exhorts, encourages. But when you turn it into a noun and make it a person, it says we have an advocate, paracleton with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. You see, when you understand the gospel, here's what I had to know, or else I would focus on the byproduct, not the bullseye. Every single day, my heart condemns me. I don't know if your heart's the same way. Father's Day. That's why I don't say happy Father's Day. You know how much guilt we carry over being dads? I've, every mom I've ever talked to carries the same mom guilt. There's actually a phrase for it. I see it online, mom guilt. Happy Father's Day. Sure. 
But you've got to understand my heart condemns me because I've failed in so many ways. And then that just begins to sit heavy on me. And then I hear the voice of God saying, you're condemned. Man, you're condemned. You're judged. You're guilty. You failed as a dad, and now your kids have to grow up with your failures as a dad. And I'll drive home, and that weight will just sit there. Any other dads with me? But then I have a paraclete an advocate, and every day Jesus Christ stands before the Father, and as the enemy accuses me, because we have an accuser of the brother, one who accuses us before the Father day and night, and the accuser says, he is a sinful, fallen father. He has not loved well. He has not served well. And in fact, he's lost his temper and blown up on his family. God, if you're righteous, you have to judge Dave Tooker. And I'm sitting there, and I'm, I know I'm dead to rights. I'm guilty, condemned. But then my advocate, my paraclete, Jesus, stands before the Father and says, Father, everything that the enemy has said is true. Dave has failed. He has blown his temper. He has lost it. He has a messed up, fallen father. But Heavenly Father, don't forget, I lived a life without sin, and I died in his place for his sin. So payment for that penalty has already been made. So, Father, you have to declare Dave Tooker guilt-free. Because if you require a second payment, you're unjust. Every day, it's declared no condemnation, guilt. That's my paraclete. That's Jesus. But it's better than that. Talk about a late-night infomercial. There's more. John 14, 16, write that down. Because Jesus, talking to his boy, says, I'm going to send another. There in John 14, 16, he calls him the helper, paracleton. I'm going to send one who will be in you. So I have one who advocates for me before the Father, and every day I hear, not guilty, not condemned. He's free to go. But then I've got to deal with, you know who my worst cricket, cr- cricket Well, critics are like crickets. They just keep chirping. You can't shut them up. You know who my worst critic is? How do you know that? Because we all, we're our own worst critics, aren't we? When I meet with people, I generally expect to hear about 10, 15, 17 things I'm doing wrong. And it's funny because sometimes it'll happen. Dave, I've got a list of things I don't like about you. List... I'll generally say, how many, how many do you have on your list? Well, I've, only, I've got 12. I know it's a lot. No, that's actually not. I've got like 476 <laughs> the things I don't like about me. So you go through your 12, and I'll see if they line up with my 476. And sure enough, they do. We're our own worst critics. I need one to advocate before the Father for me, but I need one to advocate to me for me. Now, I know that doesn't make sense. But it's actually true. The Spirit of God came to live inside of me. Because he knows today when I drive home, my first thought is going to be, man, I blew that. I really, I was trying to explain the inexplicable and define the undefinable. And Lord, I'm sorry. I'm not sure I pointed people back to you. And I'm going to hear this voice and say, Dave, you sound like, it sounds like you're, you feel condemned. Yeah, I do. And he's going to say, man, it's funny because the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So why are you not believing truth? Tender and truthful. Then when I get home, I'll just feel alone because after I'm depleted and I'm tired, I'm like, man, I'm just all alone. I say, that's funny because the Bible says, Jesus says he'll never leave you and never forsake you, that he's with you. You're not alone. Why are you not believing the truth? Tough and tender. You see, this is what the gospel, this is what Jesus has done for you. Friend, it's not about what you can do. It is about what Jesus Christ has already done. It's not about how good I am. It's about how good Jesus Christ is. It's not about what I can accomplish and what you can accomplish. I don't care how much you evangelize. That doesn't make you an awesome church. I don't care how much you give, how generous, how busy your schedule is, how much you serve, how much you read, how much you memorize. That doesn't make you awesome. Jesus is awesome, and when you learn to abide in him, all kinds of byproducts will flow from your life. If you try and copy a church without being connected to the source, it will 
crush you, but as you abide in Christ Jesus, as you abide in him, he will grow in you life that'll spring forth. It's, It's like rivers of living water, hillside. I want us to focus on the bullseye. His name is Jesus Christ. Because if not, we'll get caught up in the byproducts and we'll be exhausted. And Christianity will become a duty. And it's too awesome to be a duty, amen? Following Jesus is an utter delight. Today, would you come to him and say, Lord Jesus, your yoke is easy, your burden is light. Would you make that true for me? Where I don't feel the guilt of failure. I don't read enough. I don't study enough. I want to enjoy the skydive. I want to enjoy the ride. I don't want all of these things put on where it's a burden because to follow Jesus is a blessing. Let's pray. Father, it is truly a delight to know you through your son, Jesus Christ. And I know in my drivenness, I put all kinds of stuff. I I just, I stack it on thinking it's going to make you more happy. Thank you for the truth that you're pleased with your son and that anyone today can simply surrender and submit to Jesus and receive his righteousness. So I I pray today, this Father's Day, would be a day of salvation. For those here and those watching who think that Christianity is a burden, would you open their eyes to see it? It's a blessing. It's a delight to follow you. So Lord, I I pray you'd you'd be pleased, not as we pursue trying to be like Antioch, but as we abide in your son, Jesus Christ, would you produce incredible fruit that reaches the last, reaches the least, that those byproducts that flow out of a joyful relationship with you would flow and you'd reach many people for for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.